Looks like we're, uh, we're going to start this thing off. So I got my timer right here. We got about uh, 30 minutes to have a nine hour conversation. So we'll be uh, speaking basically as fast as we can. The, uh, the joke is, and I think I got this one from Travis Teague, is that the E in IoT is for easy, <laughs> which I have found to be very true. But uh, luckily, I got three folks here who have made IoT their business, and they're making it easier for us to kind of follow in their footsteps by providing an example. So I'll start off with you guys. Give me your, uh, I got your name here on the screen, and I've done a little bit of background research on you. <laughs> um, but tell me who you are and what you do, and I'll start with you. Awesome. Hey everybody, nice to meet you all. Uh, thank you for attending today. It's been awesome to meet with this community and, and you know, really share and discuss all the details that you guys are up to as well as the things that we're working on up here. Um, so my name is Nathan Moses Gonzalez. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of M3 Agriculture Technologies. And we deploy IoT in rural communities, uh, working with farmers uh, to help them not only optimize production, but hopefully improve their sustainability practices. So really awesome to be here and um, thank you. Yeah, as Nathan said, I'm really excited to be here as well. So thank you, Helium, for inviting me out, Nova Labs. Um, I'm Laura O'Toole. I'm the VP of Business Development at Drone Deck. I think we were mentioned a couple times around here, so some of you guys might be a little bit familiar with us. But we are the smart and secure mailbox that is consolidating all autonomous and secure delivery, or, excuse me, traditional delivery. So looking forward to the talk. My name is Larry Ketrasid. Uh, I live in Austin. I'd like to apologize for the heat in advance. If there was anything I could have done with it, like turned on the outdoor air conditioning, I would have done it before you guys came here. So it's tough. Uh, I'm the CEO of Media Sorcery. We're a workflow automation, security, and rules company. We originally got started and still have most of our business in the healthcare space, working with healthcare devices. Uh, but to our software, an IoT sensor, and the events that come out of it are the same as the events that come out of a blood glucose meter or blood pressure cuff. So we, we use our tried and true software that we burned in on the healthcare industry to build things in regenerative agriculture, uh, recycling of wind turbines, uh, you name it. We're, we're just trying to automate the processes um, and use the data that come out of the sensors. Cool. Is anyone, you can show me a rate of uh, show of hands, anyone not familiar with Helium? Okay, so we don't need to kind of start at the very beginning. Um, one of the things that you guys will see if, as you're deploying not just hotspots, but figuring out how to use sensors is that it is pretty difficult to use them if you're like me and kind of non-technical. Maybe like these guys totally have it down. So I thought we'd kind of make a jump between what I might see as really difficult and what you guys might see as really difficult. Uh, Larry, I'll start with you. Is What are the challenges that you're seeing in, let's say, a specific use case down in Mexico and on a farm down there? Uh, that's a good one to bring up since I called you like my phone a friend when I was down there and said, please, what am I doing wrong? I mean, it's, it's very different setting up a sensor network in a rural community than it is setting it up in a city where there's tons and tons of hotspots. I mean, if you've looked at the Explorer map for Austin, for example, there's hotspots everywhere. But we, we have two uh, farm projects active, and we're about to start two more down on the Pacific coast in Mexico. One is a mango tree farm, and one is a, is a traditional regenerative agricultural farm. And we installed soil moisture sensors, pH sensors, weather sensors, CO2 sensors, um, and nothing worked. Whereas I had the exact same set of sensors here in town, and they, you, they could find hotspots everywhere. So, you know, there's, there's a process, a productionalization process, if you will, that you have to get into when you're doing a project like that. You've got to, uh, the sensors need to be near the hotspot at the beginning. You've got to turn them on and make sure that they uplink to the hotspot. You've got to measure the strength of your hotspot out in these rural areas or, or the place where you're actually doing your project. So it's, it's, it's a bit of a different uh, situation than just turning on a hotspot and, and providing proof of coverage. Yeah, yeah, challenges right away. Laura, what's going on? Uh, what's, what's super tough in drone land? Yeah, so we've, we've been really lucky. We are actually using our own hotspots for our coverage for our pilot program. And we're also making our own sensors that are using the Helium network, using Laura one. So we've really minimized a lot of these difficulties that we would run into. We, we do expect that there will be some as we start large scale deployment and add more sensors on. But currently, it's been pretty straightforward. The, the biggest issue we run into is that until recently, there really wasn't a great way to monitor several hotspots. It's really, you can monitor several devices really easily. But since being here, we've, it's actually been brought to my attention that there's some companies working on that. And so there's, there's a lot of people building on the network. So anytime an issue arises, there's pretty much someone that's willing to help you out, already working on that, already thinking about it. So 
we're, it's been great for us so far. Yeah. So the challenges that you guys are going to have are not going to be the ones that most of us have because it sounds like you guys are pretty kind of tech heavy. Cool. That's that's great for you guys because <laughs> it's a difficult thing. Nathan, what uh, what are you finding that's super challenging in, in the deployments you're doing? Yeah, I, I think rural growing communities. So I work primarily with specialty crop growers. So that could be apple orchardists, uh, uh, you know, folks that grow almonds and pistachios. And it's very difficult to to communicate with them, you know, the importance of these type of tools to promote sustainability. Um, so agriculture operates on very tight margins. Um, it's a very difficult space to be in, and it takes years to return on investment. So, for example, if you're growing an apple orchard, um, it's going to cost you around sixty thousand dollars just for that app for per acre for the apple orchard to to come online. And it's going to take about you know ten to fifteen years for it to be to return that investment, and you have a tree for twenty years. Um, so it's a very long decision. Growers don't think in terms of like minutes and seconds. They tend to think, think in terms of like years and decades. And so coming into communities of practices where they're used to their, their workflow, they have a very standardized uh, way they do things, uh, very subjective knowledge, and, and introducing these sort of concepts around objectivity and, and trustworthy data uh, to develop ML applications. That's sort of been a difficult challenge, but as we start to engage deeper with the community and demonstrate how these tools are making sense on scale, I think there's really a rapid transition, and I think that's what you're seeing as well in yep. your space where uh, grower communities really are starting to understand how to embrace these technologies and are really starting to make sense of them, not just in terms of the practice and application, but in terms of their bottom line as well. Yeah. And if I could add on to that, I think, I think the big deal is when you get the, the proof, right? So one of the things that we focus on, and I'm sure you are in yours, is, is that the data is proof, right? One of the good things about having data that comes on a blockchain is it's immutable and it's there. So we want to help the farmers get carbon credits by using this proof, right? A traditional um, carbon credit process takes three or four years. You've got to go dig up the dirt, put it in a baggie, send it to a lab, wait a year, go find the exact same spot, dig up the dirt, put it in a baggie. And, and what they're measuring is a lot of things, not all yet, but a lot of things that we can measure with sensors. So you include some satellite imagery that says that you're doing things right, and you include some sensor data, and you can get you can get carbon credits a lot faster with proof that came from sensors on a blockchain network. I mean, I, I think that's cool. That is cool. Yeah. Let's see. So you guys on the on the flanks here are both doing stuff not just with um, the technology side and getting sensors in the soil, but both of you are also working with the communities to go beyond like, hey, just put the sensor on the ground and then learn from it. Can you talk a little bit about how you think about including a community in, let's say, a, a Lorwin deployment? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, that's that's really where it comes down to. So I believe both both you and I, we work with uh, different United Nations groups on this topic. And here in the U.S., it's much easier to engage with communities around technology and how these sort of tools work. Uh, the further away you get, especially as you look in developing countries, it becomes very complicated uh, to, to not only provide the infrastructure to support these communications, but also to demonstrate to them a, a practical application of how it makes sense to them on, on the ground. Yeah. Um, so always, I think that's a major challenge. It's not just about uh, coming to, to communities of practice with sensors and ideas. It's really more about meeting their needs where they're at at that point in time. So you know, I, I believe that any business or anybody in this space will have an infinite number of ideas and where the horizon goes. And all of us tend to live over that horizon, right? We as business practitioners are operating businesses today that we're planning you know, five, three to five years in the future. Uh, but when you go and engage with communities of practice, it's really important to, to address what they're looking at now and how these tools can benefit what their issues are today. Uh, so having an idea of how, this steps, how these steps work to support their, their challenges is really important. And I believe that's something that um, you know, a lot of us in the space can really benefit from is, is, is identifying use cases that, that your customers need versus coming to them with a solution that maybe they don't even need, they, maybe they don't even know they have a problem with. Yeah. Laura, how do you, I'm going to switch off the farming, I'll come back to it. But Laura, how do you, how do you find customers? This is one of, like, so the reason I'm asking this is people are here to learn how to use a people's network. They're watching the three of you start these or run these businesses and they're trying to figure out from the knowledge that you guys have how they may be able to run their own is for a box where you're going to get a drone delivery. That seems like something where it's a chicken and egg thing. You either have a million of them, there's all these drones flying all over the place, or nobody wants to use it. How do you think about starting that? So because of that, we're actually looking at ruling out the strategic zip codes. And really low-hanging fruit for our customers typically is kind of more B2B than B2C. Okay. It's, uh, it's a lot easier. You know, there's direct flight paths for drones. We also work with ground robotics, autonomous vehicles, as well as traditional delivery, though. So when you're talking about drones specifically, it is a little bit harder. You know, we are, we're working with cities and we're getting ready to roll out in our first pilot program in Lawrence, Indiana. We have commitments from the city to put in to, uh, up to 4,000 units in the city by the end of this year, beginning of next year. 
So when we get that kind of coverage, drone delivery then becomes very easy. You know, we offer charging stations and things, and we do micro weather data to address some issues that are impediments to drone delivery. So really rolling out in whole neighborhoods, new yep. developments are the easier for the, the residential side. Yeah, oh, interesting. I'd like to pause. I know that most of these things are just the four of us talking up here, but I'm sure that you guys have questions in the audience that are probably better than the ones that just the one brain up here can come up with. So if anyone has one, just stand up and yell it out. I'm sure we're not gonna have 30 people standing up at once. Anyone? Shoot. Amazon's trying to do the same thing. Amazon's trying to do the same thing with drones. I, I used to work there years ago. How would you compete with that? And are you running the same regulatory issues with regards to putting drones in the sky? You know, is it easier to do it at a state or city level, or do you still run into federal issues around airspace and things like that? So we're not actually the drone, we're the mailbox. So we work with drone providers. So Amazon could potentially be someone that we work with that delivers to a drone deck. So they're not actually really competitors. Um, we are actually very excited to get to be able to talk about this and say this. We beat Amazon to our patent by less than nine days and others by less than two weeks. So we know they're iterating in that space and are interested in what we're doing. So they're not competitors, they're potential partners. As for the regulatory side, there's always going to be a federal component when you're talking about drone delivery. The FAA is going to be involved even on the state level. Now, it, it does help when you have that state and city backing because they kind of can you know, push it forward and be like, oh, well, we're doing this, the plans, you know, that, that does help. So it's kind of getting engaged on every single level for that regulatory that space. Mm -hmm. Dig it. That brings up a good point I'll get to in a, in a second. Um, is there something really cool that I've seen out of Amir and the team is this ethos of collaboration. And so instead of competition, we are in a space now where you can collaborate with other people. You can see how you can all work together, right? We've got two kind of ag tech people up on the stage. I'm sure there is some place where instead of competing, it's like, oh, we could work together and do this. Here's how we did backhauler. Here's how we did, did that. And so whenever we start asking these questions or thinking about businesses in the world of helium, one of the first things that I'm always thinking of is, and it comes from the example set by the, the Nova formerly Helium Inc. team, is how do we work together? What's your uh, what's question? Uh, my question is, how much do you rely so far? Oh. You got a nice loud voice. How much? Yeah, I know, but they're recording us too, so <laughs> other people can hear Fair. on the on the live stream. Um, anyway, how much do you all utilize or have utilized uh, the grant process? And what I'm thinking about specifically, yesterday was the de deadline for the Climate Smart uh, Agriculture Grant that goes up to two billion dollars over the next two years on USDA. Mm -hmm. How much have you all been involved in the grant process, and do you have any insights into that? Yeah, I guess, um, you know, on my end, uh, we've worked very closely with the United States Department of Agriculture on a number of tools. Um, so we initially, when we started as a business, um, I used to work in the USDA, and I, I hopped out of the USDA to start essentially a drone company at the beginning of our, of our operations. And uh, we worked quite a bit on what's called Plant Protection Act, or Farm Bill, colloquially. Um, there is a ton of, op of, of, of processes and ways to go, go about that. And I think what's really important is actually learning how to engage with, uh, with practitioners within the USDA directly. So, uh, you know, that, that's, that's a great thing. The, the folks over there at USDA are really supportive of communities that are trying to uh, really improve agriculture. And so, you know, literally just go knock on the door at the USDA and say, hey, what's up? I have this interesting use case. Is there anybody in your office or within uh, this space that can help out on these programs? And we've had a lot of success with that. Um, even the drone that you'll see upstairs on the roof, uh, we co-developed that with the United States Department of Agriculture. And I've since deployed that you know, within the USDA as well as uh, up in Canada and some of our other partners abroad through the United Nations. So it's been very exciting to see that. And I, I highly recommend pursuing grant applications and processes. Uh, so that's a great question. Thank you. Yeah, and I'll add to that that, as that $2 billion seems like a lot of money. Um, that's, that's fantastic. <laughs> billion with a B. Yeah. 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 The, the, the grant that was just done. The grant proposal that was just uh, happened and actually is midnight last night uh, went from five million to twenty million for two years. That's a lot of money, no matter which yeah. which one of those numbers it is. Um, the thing I'd like to point out is that there are many sources for grants. The Helium Foundation is one of them. Clarissa talked about it yesterday. And so when we think about helium as an ecosystem, is that there is not only the normal kind of business competitive incentives, there's also this other good actor in the space that says, look, we want this thing to work. If you have a way of showing how this will help benefit the community, 
they are, are wide open to that. Is there anyone else that I'm not seeing? No, I don't think so. Um, maybe there is, and I'm just okay, not seeing. Like yeah, okay. Is there one? Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, this is a question for probably all three of you. Amit talked about uh, this morning um, open source 5G. Um, beyond LoRaWAN, um, say if the network has to provide extreme bandwidth and extreme low latencies, that's the promise of 5G. Um, can you guys hint out some of the applications? Can you tap some of those use cases on those extreme bandwidth, extreme low latencies? Uh, are you bandwidth hungry? Are you low latency hungry? Uh, are, are you seeing real applications in healthcare or, or drone or, or the space you guys are in? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're, so we're, we've got projects in areas, we're, we're not just doing farm projects. We've got a wind turbine recycling project where there's no coverage. We've got a vegetation management project for, I didn't know there was such a thing as vegetation management, but under solar arrays, you have to go clean up all the grass so it doesn't get in the way. We've got a, a sea cucumber track and trace project. There is no coverage for almost all the networks in any of those places. And, and they're places where people need the coverage. So what, what we're trying to figure out is, you know, we have, we have one of our hotspots uh, down in Mexico for both the sea cucumber project and the regenerative agriculture project on top of uh, a shack. It's a, it's a store. Uh, and the only reason we have it there is it's the only huge satellite uh, internet network in a 50 mile radius from where we're at. So these people are, you know, we're, we're splitting the, the cost with them. We're giving them some dough and we'd like to give them some more money by providing 5G because there's no cellular coverage out there. There's, it's not, it's not enough of a uh, revenue generator for the AT&Ts or Telcells in this case to go out there and do it. So. I think it's, I mean, it's it's a layered approach as far as what we're doing. You know, we're going to put sensors down to help these farmers and these bioculture people do what they do, and then we're going to go automate some of those tasks, and then we're going to help them all go get carbon credits, and then we're going to build some infrastructure on top of that to, to help these people, all while providing some of that crypto back to the community so they can replicate those processes again and again. Right, yeah, and to add to that, I think that um, telecommunications companies have conflated um, data use with people, right? Uh, they, they're looking at your cell phones, they want to make sure that they have your cell phones on their carriers. But if you look in rural growing communities and environments that we operate in, there's such a need for, for, uh, for data and such a dearth of it. And so, you know, things that we can see in direct applications with, around 5G and farming, for example, uh, you know, currently there will be these uh, large robots that will drive through the orchards and take photos, and then somebody has to take a hard drive, pull it out, go bring it back to a network, plug it in, translate the data to a server, bring it back, just to get the data, right? If you could create a high bandwidth process that could actually enable you to transfer that directly from the field uh, to the cloud for processing and back down, it would, it would really streamline that process. And then in terms of actually, um, you know, orchards are very, very tight spaces. Uh, and as we start to see more automation, I would imagine that those spaces will become even tighter as we move away from having uh, humans picking uh, fruit, for example, to robots. And so really needing precision guidance, uh, much more precise than, than what we can see from GPS or even differential GPS, using things like RISI as well as integrating that with, um, with satellite data is going to be a really a, a large use case. And I feel like in ag, that's going to be a really big transition. I imagine like, you know, within 10, 15 years time in rural communities, you'll see a ton of data coming out of it from robots and even still with not a lot of people in there. It's interesting to think about that, huh? Is that there's so much data on a farm that we just, the farmer knows that the rest of us don't. And that is really one of the big promises of, of giant sensor deployments is that we all get access to that data and we can see it. And that's one of the things I know you guys are doing. Laura, I want to make sure we hit you with the um, 5G and latency stuff. Is, I'm imagining drones have to be semi-accurate. <laughs> yes, uh, yes, yeah, so it's very important that drones are accurate. So the simple answer is, is yes. We're actually, all the devices, all our units are already connected to cellular. They're not using 5G right now because FAA is not allowing drones to be using FAA, uh, excuse me, 5G. So it makes sense for us to also be on 4G as well. The robotics, you know, everything's using it. So, um, but we have a whole lot of sensors. We're just discovering LoRaWAN really. And so in Helium still, it's still very early for us. So we're kind of at this place where most of our sensors are actually using cellular. And we're slowly starting to move them over and start testing. We're doing monitoring right now, but there is so many different possibilities for our sensors. We're doing micro weather. Can we move that over to LoRaWAN? Well, the easy answer there is yes, yes, we can. People are already doing it. You know, We're looking at um, gunshot tra tracing with noise. That's something else that we can put on the LoRa network. 
but for the, the latency and stuff, we are, videos is kind of the big thing right now. So we have, we have cameras on our decks, both inside and outside. Those are obviously can't function on, on Laura One. It's the, the data packets are, are too great. It's constantly streaming. So things like that is, we're definitely still going to be using cellular network and eventually, hopefully, 5G. Did you say gunshot, Tracy? Yes, yes. So we people, were... people shooting down your drones with guns? Is that what the yeah. gunshot Tracy? That's actually, it's not for that. It's for <laughs> municipalities. We work really closely with a lot of smart cities. But that oh. is a concern that a lot of people bring up. Yeah. But I was going to sadly say welcome to Texas, but that's, that's too close <laughs> to home right now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's... Uh, Texas actually has the most robust drone delivery um, yeah. pilot, pilots going on right now, and that has not been an issue yet. I don't, I don't think people realize how often sometimes drones are flying around near you and you, you don't notice. We're not constantly looking up. They're not as loud as people think. So yeah. that's a concern, but yeah. not as major of a concern as some, of the, as some people believe it to be. But it is yeah. something that a lot of people are innovating to, to deal with ahead of time. So, Dig it. Let's shift back to something super useful for hopefully you guys is that at the beginning of the, the business journey for you, or maybe at the beginning of the LoRaWAN business journey, is what were some of the challenges that you hit that if someone came up and said, oh, I'm starting a business in, in Helium, I'm going to use Helium, that you'd say like, hey, think about this piece and solve this first, or at least pay attention to this. Yeah, I, I always, you know, what I love about being here in Austin is that my mind's always in rural areas. Um, so, you know, we're, we're in such ubiquitous coverage. Uh, we have 5G. There's 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 so much coverage here, yeah. and um, you know, being in the city and and going out to a rural area with your hotspot, you're going to have to create a lot of infrastructure to support it. Um, so, for example, like in our orchards, we'll have uh, it's about a 12 foot pole that we bury three feet in concrete into the earth. We have a large solar panel, a battery. We're literally having to create networks to support LoRa, but that's what, exactly what we need to see for agriculture. Um, so, I, I think that's one of the major challenges is. Um, Thinking about the infrastructure and how you're going to backhaul your data is a really critical piece of this of this puzzle. And obviously, if you can plug into Wi-Fi networks, that's going to make it, or you know, just home uh, networks, going to make it much more affordable to start. Uh, but really, being aware of the costs up front and and what your um, what your return on investment is going to be, what that timeline is going to look like, and therefore what sort of service you can provide. Uh, really having a full package and, and a firm understanding of your application, I think, is a, is a critical step at the starting point. Yeah, I agree, Laura. What? Yeah, so I mean, as I said earlier, we haven't run into too many challenges, but the advice I have is don't be limited by the use cases that people are all, all thinking about. You know, we have so many sensors that we're trying to see if we can put them on LoRaWAN because there's so many benefits to it. And you hear people talking about like, well, what, what can you do on LoRaWAN? I don't, I don't think that's the right, the right uh, mindset for it. It's what can we not do? So there's so many possibilities. You just got to start trying. You got to start iterating in it. And I, I think that's a really important part of this right now. Yeah. I think everybody needs to find their own personal gristle king. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and I, you know, I'm only half kidding. I mean, the Laura said it earlier. The network is really, really helpful. I mean, you've helped me out a lot. Uh, Kaplan's helped me out a lot. Laura and I just met about two or three days ago, and we're already talking about how we can exchange information. The Discord is really helpful. I mean, and and some of this stuff we're we're still building the network. I mean, we're still doing bleeding edge stuff. So. Uh, I, I think coming from a traditional healthcare company, we didn't ask a lot of questions. Healthcare is very private. We're, we're supposed to be protecting data, but just ask. I mean, if, if you're trying to build something, um, it's possible somebody hasn't thought of it before, but for the most part, you'll find somebody that's willing to help you out or try this. Have you tried that? I mean, it, it's, a, it's a great community. I mean, it really is a, is a good community. Yeah. What, um, what do you guys see? As far as the future, and I'll, I'll queue up the first piece that I see is all of this data that we're seeing collected is useful not just for your customers or your business, but it's useful almost globally depending on, on what it is. Yeah. is. Are you thinking about incorporating that, that value of that utility in your business plan or is that still something like, hey, I know that exists, but we've got our hands full with, with what we've got? Yeah, we're, I mean, we're absolutely thinking about how to... I think I mentioned earlier that we we have a, a, uh, a product that's a proof of authenticity and quality, yep. right? Same thing that we did for healthcare. We were moving COVID-19 test kits. We had to prove that they were stored at a particular temperature. And that's how I first met you, right? We were trying to find a sensor to measure cold storage. Yep. But we put all of that data on uh, a, an immutable blockchain, right? We store it either on IPFS or Arweave somewhere so that we can say it this happened, and if you 
don't know what happened, the who, what, when, and where is out on a, a blockchain somewhere. Yep. So we're, we're storing as much of that data for posterity as we can. And, and I think when you get to a best practices, whether you're, you're doing some wind turbine recycling or cucumbers or whatever, somebody else in the world is going to want that data. So making it available is, is a good thing, and it's a big thing. Totally. Yeah, and I, I would like to add on to that to just thinking about all the other national data sets and international data sets that are already available. Um, I think that's what's going to be really fascinating here is you have, you know, you can look at macro, mesro, and micro levels of data. And a lot of the things that we work with at M3 is mostly the micro level. We have a bunch of embedded sensors on the earth, and we're really thinking about how to now scale that up to what we do with our drones in terms of sensing with mapping, as well as how we can then incorporate satellite data to make the most sense of that. Um, so I feel like, you know, for folks that work especially on algorithm side of things or ML, uh, these are some really exciting opportunities uh, to find ways to collaborate with folks. And I think that's what's going to be really exciting is uh, moving forward uh, as we start to normalize data and best practice around that, uh, creating uh, synergies between those levels of, of data and making meaning out of that is going to be a massive boon for any number of industries. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so for us, we're kind of similar uses for as Larry for the, the blockchain. You know, we're, we have a lot of data coming in. We have authentication pieces, micro weather, car counting, a lot of data that's really interesting to municipalities and cities. And so having the blockchain is, is great for that. It allows us to be able to make sure that data is, you know, it's there, it's safe, we know exactly what's happened. It's not going to be changed. It's going to be available for people. So that it's, it's been great for us for that. Yeah. And then I guess we'll finish off with what's um, what's next for you guys. And Laura, I'll start with you because you got some pretty exciting stuff coming on the pipe at uh, Drone Deck. Tell me what's going on next. Yeah, so we're actually getting ready to launch our second crowdfunding um, round on uh, Start Engine, and we're very very excited about that. So anyone who's interested in, in investing and you're not an accredited investor, you don't have to worry about that. You can go ahead and invest, and we're really excited to get to announce that. We so. should start a table like the guys that are selling 5G, and you can sell it here. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> That's a good idea. <laughs> um, and then we also, I, I mentioned it a little bit earlier, we are getting ready to start our pilot program, our first one in Lawrence, Indiana, and we're going to be testing a lot of different things there, and one of them is LoRaWAN actually in the field in our units and some of our sensors using that. So we're really excited about that, and we have more pilot programs to come. So. Ripping. Awesome. Larry, what's next for you, Doug? Uh, we're just, we, we have projects coming out of our ears, man. We, there, there's so much demand for automation using the sensor data. Uh, I, I'm, I, I never knew that there was such a thing as sea cucumbers before. I've heard about them. Okay. I, you know, somebody came up and said, we need to monitor sea cucumbers. We'd like to monitor the carbon in the water. There's floating sensors on lower end that can measure certain things in there. I mean, I'm, I'm excited. I'm, I'm excited to see what uh, what someone creates next on top of it. And we're, we're really excited about the 5G opportunities to build on top of what we're, we've already put out there. Yeah. Nathan? Yeah. I mean, I, I think what I'm just really excited about is to continue to work with growing communities and help them achieve their sustainability goals. I think that's a major hurdle for us. So, uh, you know, United Nations put forth that by 2050, we're going to need to see as much as 70% more food produced internationally. Uh, the former Secretary of Agriculture, Sonny Perdue, said here in the United States alone, we're going to need to produce 40 uh, percent more food uh, by 2050. And so the time of, of competition, I feel, is over, I hope. I feel like it's time for, for businesses to really to start to collaborate around these very urgent problems. And um, you know, I think that that's what really excites me about the helium community, whether it's working with groups like uh, D-Web or, or talking with folks on Discord about you know, how we can coordinate our, our best practices and efforts. Um, I really am looking forward to engaging further and deeper within helium as well as other communities that share this sort of ethos. So yep, that's yeah. what I'm looking forward to. Dig it. If there's anything that anyone in the audience could help you with, we've got 56 seconds left, so don't burn it. Um, if, you're, if you're asked and kind of wave a magic wand and solve some problem in your business, Laura, I'll start with you. What, what would that be? So not more than just a specific problem. If you, if you hear about our use case and you were like, well, we're iterating on this thing that we think might help you, we're building this, then reach out. There, again, there's so many builders on LoRaWAN and the Helium network and everything. And so it's hard to be aware of everyone that's out there. You know, we're really aggressive on partnering and we're trying to offer the best solutions we can to our customers. So if that's something that you think you guys, you know, have a, have a good tool for, reach out to us, please. Take it. Nathan, anything you could use help on? Uh, exactly what she said. Okay. Yeah. Great answer. Reach out hard. Yeah. Larry, anything for you? I, I really need a soil organic carbon sensor for one thing, but I, I would agree. I mean, uh, we're all on Discord. If you guys have any suggestions or you need any help, 
uh, reach out and find us. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to share what, what we've learned. I'm happy to take credit for everything Nick taught me and yeah. pretend that that's mine. So right on. And that's time. Thank you guys. Thanks for coming on. Thank you. Thank you.